Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Stephanie Sherman. I'm the course leader for MA Narrative Environments here at CSM, and uh, really thrilled for those of you joining us in person and online for this season's kickoff to launch Digital Innovation Season 3.0. Um, digital Innovation Season, or otherwise known as DIS for short, at Central St. Martin's, explores and celebrates creativity in the digital space through an inspiring program of public talks and workshops open to students across the college throughout February. This is a unique and inspiring opportunity for students across CSM to come together to explore emerging technologies through unique philosophies and practices through conversation and collaboration. This is open to students across courses, BA and MA, and sometimes special guests. Hello and welcome to those of you here tonight. And the topics we address in this season are so new, so expansive, and so critical. We know it will inspire cross-disciplinary fertilization, speculation, and creativity. So after tonight's talk, we invite all of you to keep the conversation going in the bar, whether over a drink of water, apple juice, or beer, as you like. The 2024 season theme of DIS is planetary sensing, and this theme brings a planetary perspective to the climate crisis, social impact, and cutting edge technologies. So what do we mean by planetary sensing? Well, the planet Earth senses, understands, and communicates through arrays of satellites, sensors, and servers that shape geographies, climate, science, and societies. Planetary sensing investigates how technologies are impacting our environment and, how, and also how technologies can help with the ecological crisis. Rather than imagining a schism between the local and the global, a planetary perspective considers how the material, social, technical, and biogeochemical conditions of the planet converge, shaping information, interfaces, <coughs> and intelligences. Planetary sensing combines speculative design and social infrastructure. So the whole season explores how digital technologies can be applied and leveraged towards propositions for a resilient <coughs> planet. Throughout the season, we will host UK-based, and some, some from not too far afield, artists and designers who are working on these topics across geographies, technologies, and intelligences. They are developing philosophies, practices, and perspectives that transport us across space and time. There's um, still room available in the season, so we really invite you to join us, either um, online or here in the LVMH Lecture Theater for talks throughout the season. And then there's also special workshops hands-on throughout where you can test lots of different technologies. Please sign up for those ASAP as spaces are going fast. So there's many people to thank for tonight's, uh, and the whole, the whole season really. So first of all, thanks to Stefan Swinechny, our, the Digital Partnerships and Innovation Manager, who's been an incredible co-conspirator on producing this season. It's been an absolute pleasure, Stefan, thank you. Uh, Rachel Pearl, who's been totally instrumental in co-curating a lot of the um, speakers that you'll hear throughout the season. John Woolston, who heads up Emerging Media and Technology at CSM, <coughs> who's the mastermind behind the whole program. Betty Marenko, who helped uh, think through some of the early people to invite to the season. And in general, CSM, for supporting this cross-disciplinary, cross-course collaboration and initiative. So tonight, you'll hear about Whole Earth Codec, a speculative proposal for an autoregressive, multimodal foundation model that allows the planet to observe itself. This proposal for a planetary observatory moves beyond foundation models composed of anthropocentric language data towards foundation models that draw upon the wealth of ecological information imminent to the planet. Moving from raw sense data to high dimensional embeddings in latent space, the codec enables a computational reason that transcends perception alone. And this project is led by Christina Liu and Connor Cook, who I have the absolute pleasure of introducing this evening. Thanks for being here. Christina Liu is a researcher and technologist combining rigorous technical research with speculative world building in order to instantiate a more viable future with artificial intelligence. She's a doctoral student in computer <coughs> science at Oxford, 
prototyping machine learning models capable of open-ended evolution and machinic mutation. She is also an affiliate researcher at Anskathera, a think tank for the speculative philosophy of computation hosted by the Berggruen Institute, where she was a studio researcher in the inaugural 2023 cohort. Previously, she was a software engineer at DeepMind, conducting socio-technical research and implementing systems for machine learning experimentation at scale. Connor Cook is a me media artist and researcher from California, currently based in Amsterdam. His work unravels the recursive relationships between technical systems and their broader ecological and cultural context through a practice of computational performance. Through audiovisual performances, he translates the complex dynamics of these interactions into collective, effective experiences that double as forms of critique. His work has been shown at the Matt Museum in Lisbon, Serpentine Gallery in London, iFilm Museum in Amsterdam, the Southern California Institute of Architecture in Los Angeles, and the VAC Zetter in Venice. He holds an MA in Geodesign from the Design Academy Eindhoven and a BA in the History of Art and Architecture from Harvard University. He recently completed Anskathera, a research fellowship in the philosophy of technology at the Berggruen Institute. And he's currently an instructor at the Design Academy Eindhoven. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Connor and Christine on the Whole Earth Codec. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming tonight um, and thank you so much Stephanie for the invitation. We're super excited to present this project today. So uh, as has been introduced, today we're going to present the Whole Earth Codec, which is a project that we've been developing over the past few years and are really in the midst of uh, developing even further. So to begin. So the Whole Earth Codec, we situate this along a long evolutionary trajectory of the history of observation on the planet and the history of planetary observation. So observation is something that transcends and extends beyond and before even our species emergence. It's a fundamental way in which a variety of species, human and non-human alike, orient themselves, process, and take action within the world. But specifically, the, the history that we're interested in is the, um, is the technologization of observation. So the ways in which technological instruments extend and expand our observational capacities, which in turn extend um, our capacities for what can be known and thus acted upon. Because while instruments determine what can be done, they also determine to some extent what can be thought. Often the instrument provides a possibility it is an initiator of investigation. So when talking about the technologization of observation, the most obvious uh, starting point would be the telescope, um, which really revolutionized uh, the way that we're able to observe. And an interesting um, and sort of unknown um, starting point is that the telescope was first used for terrestrial observation. So before being pointed to the cosmos, it was used for land surveying techniques, for military tactics, etc. You can see in the really the bottom left-hand corner, um, this was the first use of a telescope, or the first depiction of a telescope um, and use of a Dutch spyglass in the beginning of the 17th century. And this is really significant for us in thinking through um, our current state of sort of terrestrial observation today and where we've, where, how we've evolved from this, this point. Uh, Galileo is often credited as the inventor of the telescope, but he was not exactly the inventor. This emerged from a long trajectory of optics research and spect spectacle craftsmanship. But what Galileo did was sort of turn the gaze of the telescope from the planet itself up to the cosmos. And by our standards today, uh, his early telescope, a refraction telescope, was quite rudimentary in nature. Uh, it had an aperture of 1.5 centimeters. The aperture is the mechanism that controls how much light is allowed into the telescope and roughly corresponds to the amount of information that can be gathered from the image, the information complexity or richness of that image. So in this early telescope with a 1.5 centimeter aperture, this was capable of a three times magnification of um, the object of observation. And just through over sort of iterations over the years, um, he was able to increase this magnification, increase the width of the aperture, um, and make some pretty significant uh, discoveries in uh, astronomical research. The most famous discovery was the um, observation of craters and mountains on the moon. 
but also he was able to observe the changing crescent phases on Venus and also the movement of the moons of Jupiter. And these last two examples are, are particularly interesting because these two findings were inconsistent with the geocentric model of the universe at the time and eventually sort of set along a trajectory that led to the Copernican revolution, a sort of complete upset and revolution of the way that we think of ourselves as a human species in the universe. And it's this recursive relationship between instrumentation, observation, and the types of knowledge that can be produced that is where we really are trying to situate um, the codec and the project that we're presenting today. So in the years that followed Galileo's uh, use of the telescope, there's many really interesting examples of this evolution of instrumentation as a way of increasing the aperture of observation. So you can see it in really sort of raw, direct form um, in this 1673 illustration of a 46 meter long focal length uh, telescope. And there's been a sort of variety, uh, like speciation of different telescopes over the years as well. And of course, the radio telescopes we use today are sort of a far departure from these early optical form telescopes. But what we'd really like to propose is that the history of observation is also a history of <coughs> instrumentation. And so this historical evolution has sort of reached its apotheosis at the moment. Um, in 2009, with the Event Horizon Telescope, which is kind of a misleading name, the Event Horizon Telescopes, plural, is maybe more accurate. Um, but what this project was, and is, it's still ongoing, is an international scientific collaboration, which was responding to the observational limitations of individual telescopes. So rather than just widening and widening the aperture of an individual radio telescope, what the project did was network together a bunch of individual telescopes scattered all around the, all around the Earth, and pointing all of these telescopes to one point in the night sky, in this case, um, to the very center of the Milky Way. And you can see some of the, the different telescopes that have been used here. And um, what's interesting about this example is that in doing so, what was essentially produced was a giant camera. The Earth was sort of recast as a giant camera with an aperture the width of the entire Earth. And what this was used for, most famously, was the production of this image um, in 2019. This was the first um, produced image of a black hole. And I put image in quotes here because it's actually, actually more accurate to think of this as a data visualization um, because this is not sort of the re reception of sort of light information to produce an, an image, but rather this was produced through the gathering of um, electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation data all around the planet that then was synthetically stitched together by computational processes. And this is a, a really sort of big shift in how we can think of observation or sensing or the planet as a sensor uh, in general. And I think it's sort of really comes across in these images where if we're used, I think in our minds, we're used to seeing astronomical imagery, the scientist posed next to a telescope observing out into the cosmos. And you see here these like proud promotional images of the project where the scientists are posing next to data storage um, containers. And it, it really, um, I think, indicates the, the shift to um, actually what's at stake here and maybe what's interesting about this project besides the scale is actually that this is a really impressive um, computational operation. So observation forms just the first step in this long chain of operations that eventually leads us to this image. So this image is not just automatically produced, but it has to go through many different stages of data manipulation um, and machine learning techniques to produce um, this image that we, can, uh, that we can see with our eyes. And I really like what the director of the Event Horizon Telescope Project describes he describes the computer as a silicon lens, um, so using this sort of optical terminology, but rather than culling light to produce an image, um, this silicon lens culls data to produce this singular image. So to revise a statement that I made earlier where observation is synonymous with in instrumentation, we can expand upon this by claiming that observation is sort of the um, synonymous with instrumentation plus computation. And it's this computational aspect that we really want to focus on today and how we're trying to situate our project. 
So while the Event Horizon Telescope provides a really obvious example um, of the, the planet as a sensor, we can think of the um, sort of wide variety of distributed sensing that's already happening around the Earth as also a form of the planet as sensor, with, but with the gaze folded back inwards on itself, taking the Earth rather than outer space as the object of observation. And a lot has been made of um, planetary sensing, but most of this attention has been on the act of data collection itself, on the sensor build out, on the infrastructure, et cetera. Um, but less has been explored about the processing um, and sort of computation of this data, specifically uh, with respect to recent developments in AI. So that's really where we're situating um, our projects now. So sort of in order to really motivate the project, I kind of want to give you some background on the state of AI as it is today. So if we really kind of strip it down to the basics, machine learning basically involves statistical modeling. You're kind of taking a bunch of prior data and you want to produce predictions about new data that match the statistical distribution of all of the training data that you've looked at thus far. You know, so if you want to learn a binary classification, for example, um, you want to sort of maybe carve up the points in a graph, you basically want to create the formula for a line that divides the space so that everything in one side is in one category, everything on the other side is another in a way that fits your training data. But machine learning is not really only useful for categorization. Um, there's some forms of data out there that you know, is more amenable to mathematical manipulations. There's data that's in the form of numbers. You also have data in the form of images, you have words, et cetera. So machine learning is capable of sort of modeling these non-numerical forms of information into mathematical strings of numbers that can sort of be mapped into a high dimensional latent space so that they, can, they become computable. Um, so, you know, given a big data set, machine learning is capable of sort of transforming it into this massive latent space where data points that are similar are mathematically close to each other while the ones that are dissimilar are far away. So this is sort of what allows models to produce generations. So if a machine learning model has learned basically the a latent space that contains the statistical distributions of all the past data it has looked at, when you give it new input data, it's able to output more further sequences that sort of match its latent space distribution. It can tell you what is likely to come next because it knows what, is, what you have given it, what it's similar to. So a recent paradigm that has sort of really taken hold in the field is that of the foundation model. So a foundation model is sort of massive in size and scope. It has, it takes basically a general corpus of data that is at the scale of the internet. They are trained by unsupervised learning. So when you have all this data, you can't really have a human go through and tell you, you know, annotate every piece of it. The training process has to be unsupervised through a bunch of clever little tricks that basically allow you to learn things without needing any labels on this data. There are sort of emergent capacities that foundation models have from ingesting a massive training corpus that they're not deliberately trained to do. And ultimately, these general models can be fine-tuned for a bunch of downstream tasks. So an example of a foundation model would be GPT-4, which is a large language model. It is sort of fine-tuned to create chat GPT, so it can sort of um, learn how to process this two-party conversational interface. So, you know, through the statistical relations within the vast corpus of data, machine learning models are able to learn all these hidden patterns and have emergent capabilities that they're not explicitly trained for. So an example here would be how language models like GPT-4 are not deliberately trained to be capable of machine translation, but because its training corpus contains you know, so many instances of different languages in close proximity to each other, it's actually able to perform translation. 
But I think we, we're trying to argue that despite the massive scale of these existing models, they're still quite limited in terms of the data that they've ingested. So in one sort of aspect is how the data sets are really limited to human culture, and not just human culture, it's that which is available to be scraped from the internet. Um, so on the left here, we have this really beautiful visualization of the common crawl. So this is, um, it's like basically a scrape of the entire internet by following hyperlinks and collecting all of the text of each web page. So the common crawl is a massive percentage of the training data used for the last publicized GPT. Um, so GPT-3 was trained with about 85% internet data, 60% of which was the common crawl, also includes Wikipedia. Um, so we really need to sort of widen the aperture of what machine intelligence is looking at. So um, it's kind of a waste to focus all of this capacity on only human culture. We think that you know even the entire internet really reflects a portion of information that is imminent to the planet. There is a lot of data that's not publicized, it's not aggregated, it's not digitized, it's not even recorded. Um, and ultimately, human culture is really only a subset of the broader ecology of information that is available on the planet. And so, I'm not only trying to problematize the limited focus of the data, I'm also trying to talk, I, another important aspect is how the, the modalities of the data themselves are quite limited. So there's been an explosion of work in large language models recently because, you know, it, language is purported to basically be a repository of so much of human knowledge. Um, but, you know, what about the information that cannot be captured in natural language? When you only are learning from a single modality, you have a limited surface for understanding. We need more modalities so that we can have more complex, more richer information. So there's been research re more recently in creating multimodal <coughs> models. Most of them are bimodal. So they look, they can basically take both text and image. Um, this is what produces tools you might know, such as Midjourney or Dali. And the way that they're trained is that they basically have pairs of images with text, and they want to sort of encode these separate modalities and map them into a latent space such that the text and image that refers to the same thing have a ver are very close to each other in that latent space. And so, you know, this is, once they're projected into the joint embedding space, you can then give it new text and it can sort of produce an image for you that matches that text. So this has led to, you know, an explosion of these image to text models, but ultimately we argue that they're still really focused on the domains of human culture, you know, they're trained on human annotated pairings. And ultimately, there's so much more information out there than just two modalities that can be processed by, by a machine intelligence. And so as Connor sort of argued earlier, like, the sensing is not separate from processing. You know, when you're using your eyes to look at something, you're, you know, you're, there's a lot of automatic processing going on, your, sort of, uh, your optical nerve is filling in blind spots, you know, the image is being flipped upside down. You're not merely sensing raw data. There is basically this blurring of both sensing and cognition. And so we are positioning our project, the Whole Earth Codec, as this sort of information processing over the raw sense data that is produced by the planet. And, you know, we really think that there will be new forms of understanding available from uniting all of this ecological data into a single knowledge architecture that can be comprehended by machine intelligence. And we really think that, you know, it could reveal patterns that sort of transcend direct, unaltered perception alone. Okay, so this takes us to our proposal, uh, which is titled The Whole Earth Codec. Uh, the Whole Earth Codec is a multimodal foundation model that allows for planetary self-observation. 
And by planetary here, we don't just mean planetary in scale, but also planetary as in scope, as, as has been discussed. Um, and this name is a direct reference to the Whole Earth Catalog. And the Whole Earth Catalog was a print catalog, first published in 1968 by Stuart Brand, uh, which was essentially a compendium of different DIY guides, product listings, educational content, all sort of emerging and coming from the back to land and counterculture movement that was happening at the time in the 1960s in California. And the sort of overall um, aim of the catalog was to promote a more holistic integration of technology and ecology. And it did this by emphasizing uh, self-sufficiency, self-empowerment, um, and a DIY ethos, sort of giving people the tools um, themselves to like make sort of more ecological transformations in their immediate vicinity and to form a deeper connection with the planet. So in moving from the Whole Earth Catalog to the Whole Earth Codec, we both extend, um, we extend upon and also depart from the legacy of the Whole Earth Catalog. So as I said, the Whole Earth Catalog at its core seeks a holistic integration of ecology and technology. It promotes a DIY ethos. It focuses on small scale interventions. It emphasizes self-sufficiency and a sort of libertarian ethos. And it fundamentally operates through analog um, media, which is the catalog. The Whole Earth Codec maintains this core goal, which is to seek a holistic, more holistic integration of ecology and technology at scale. It doesn't abandon this DIY ethos, but it tries to arrive and enable that DIY um, possibility through an infrastructural approach, through a specific centralization. Uh, it's planetary in scale. It emphasizes entanglement rather than self-sufficiency, and it fundamentally deals with digital information. So in doing so, we're kind of trying to disrupt these well-worn binaries between top-down, bottom-up, centralized, decentralized, public, private, etc. So the name codec in particular, it may be new to some people. So if we ask, what is a codec? A codec is an abbreviation of encoder and decoder. And we can also think of these as analogous to compression and decompression. So it sounds like it's quite a technical term, but I guarantee you, all of you have experienced a codec today. If you listen to a piece of music or watched a video, you're seeing the sort of outputs of a codec. An MP3, for example, it takes like the raw audio information of a file, it compresses it into a more condensed um, sort of storage. And then, so we can share things or store it on our phone. And then in the act of listening, an MP3 is decoded, brought back to the realm of human sort of auditability. Uh, audibility. And in a way, we can think of the Whole Earth Catalog as an analog version of a codec. So it assembles a vast amount of information and know-how, recipes, permaculture information, et cetera, from around the world into this compressed representational format of the catalog. And this takes the form of recipes, instructions, guides. So through this compression, it allows this information to be distributed throughout the world. And then when someone cooks a recipe or builds a structure from the information in the codec, we can think of this as an act of sort of decoding or decompression, bringing this information back into the world. And our proposal for the Whole Earth Codec is really not so different. Like, we're talking about assembling and gathering this ecological information in the world, um, encoding this, compressing this into numerical representations in the, in the model, and then decoding this in the form of ecological predictions. And so the core difference between these, the Whole Earth Catalog and the Codec is while the Catalog compresses, compresses information for human understanding, the Whole Earth Codec compresses information for machinic understanding. So the, use, the term codec in machine learning is slightly different than what I just described. And on a, I'm gonna describe it a bit more abstractly, not so technically, but essentially what it's enabling us to do is move from this sort of messy, high dimensional information in the world into the sort of um, numerical representations of the model and then decode it back into some useful thing in the world like a um, prediction or object recognition, et cetera. So if we take this image, for example, and say that we wanted to run an object recognition on this, identify which objects are, have the model, identify which objects are in this image, um, 
what we would need to do is sort of think of this image, break it down into a bunch of different pixels. Imagine that if this is a 1920 by 1080 image, imagine that there's this many pixels in the image. And together, these would um, produce over 2 million different individual pixels. We can refer to these as dimensions because dimensions essentially being different, all the different parameters that could be changed that make up what this piece of information is. Looking a bit more in detail, if each of these were broken down into a pixel, actually they can be just represented as a number, a grayscale value between zero and one. And together, in a long list, um, we can store these as a sort of ordered list of numbers or a vector, um, which is representative of the information in this. So what the model would need to do is take this sort of big list of numbers and arrive, if we want to um, perform object recognition, arrive at sort of a more condensed understanding of what, or abstraction of what exactly is in that image. And so if we just think about how we would view this image and what's happening right now when we're looking at this, we're kind of engaged in a similar process. We don't see two million pixels, sort of, we'd, um, just existing in this image. We see some tree-like things, some leafy textures, some dappled shadows on the ground, some type of like fuzzy white line. So already in our brains, as Christina has alluded to, when we're viewing this, we're engaging in a cognitive process of um, pattern recognition and abstraction. So we're taking this from, if we could describe this as a list of two million numbers, or we could describe it as something with 12 trees with leaves, and that description is, in essence, a sort of abstraction or a conceptual compression of what is in this image. And what those com compressions or abstractions allow us to do is they allow us to draw horizontal comparisons across like, different media typologies. They allow us to understand generalities or st statistical invariances that exist generally across images. So in the case of a uh, convolutional neural network, for example, What's happening when we pass through the different layers of the model is we're sort of increasing the complexity of these sort of patterned abstractions. So we might start in the early layers by detecting um, simple things like edges or corners or boundaries. Together, assembling some of these, we might begin to detect something like textures. Um, moving further down the model, we might begin to see the sort of contours of objects. And in doing so, in moving through these different layers, we're arriving at um, sort of more complex abstractions of what's um, contained in the image. And it brings us to this interesting paradox, which is by stripping away detail, compression or encoding reveals the latent contours of the biosphere. If we say, rather than the image example, which I just gave, if we're feeding in a bunch of information, ecological information, sort of what sort of deeper levels of patterns or abstractions might emerge from that? Um, something that is very interesting and exciting about um, these models is that they're capable of sort of much deeper levels of abstraction that we might be capable of um, in our brains um, and can identify patterns that don't necessarily map onto our human understandings of the pattern, type of patterns that we see visually um, by observing the world. Yes. Cool. <clears throat> so... Now that Connor has sort of abstractly described what we want the whole Earth Codec to do, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, you know, how concretely does this happen? What are the technological processes that allow the codec to exist? And I think the first question that comes to mind is, you know, where is all of this ecological data actually coming from? Um, and, you know, what kinds of data are we talking about? So the planet contains so much raw stimuli in the form of energy, particles, in the shape of waves and fields, etc. All of this information is transduced by machine <coughs> sensors and also biological ones. So transduction is the process through which stimuli, energy, is transformed into another form, in this case, electrical signals, whether those in your brain or that of a machine. Um, it's through mass machine sensors that we argue we can capture the, the ecological data of the planet. So we're basically proposing a global distributed sensor network of many different modalities. And so 
even though it may sound far-fetched, there is actually a lot of precedent for these sort of distributed sensor networks. And, you know, network here is a logic that really allows us to access information that is only possible through its distribution. So one example here is the Australian Acoustic Observatory. So this was a lot of microphones scattered across Australia that were used to monitor the sounds of wildlife. There is also, I mean, the various orbits around the Earth are kind of filled with Earth observation satellites for remote sensing. So these are used to image the Earth, some of it with you know, straight up literal images. Others produce images through techniques such as radar, lighter, and synthetic aperture radar. Um, and so basically these massive networks to monitor and sense the planet is not a new idea. What we're proposing is that the sensing layer of the codec is sort of constituted of both the old networks and also new sensors of all these different modalities and sort of integrated to capture the wealth of information from the biosphere. And so you might be like thinking, okay, Christina, now you're proposing global surveillance. And I'm here to tell you that, no, that I think Connor said earlier that there's a lot of sort of computational techniques that allow you to break past these old binaries of like, you know, open and closed, um, yeah, private, totally, and then totally open. And so we, one I wanna talk about is the technique called federated learning. So this is basically different cryptographic techniques that allow you to train models without actually looking directly at the data. And so the way this works is that, let's say you have a sensor and it's capturing a lot of data, and then it, it can basically locally train a model and then only push what it has learned, the model weights, to the bigger aggregation to train the actual whole Earth codec. And so um, this technique basically allows for us to break past this binary of open versus closed, and it kind of alludes to some of our recent work in thinking about how to govern the whole Earth codec. So we really wanna think about governance as a mechanism, as something that's emerged from the system rather than imposed on it afterwards by an institution. Um, and then the second thing I wanna talk about is, you know, now that we have this wealth of information from the planets, how do we actually process it? How do we encode it into the form that we want? And here, I think we wanna keep it a bit open-ended. We don't really, we, I'm gonna kind of define what we want it to do, but I think there's a lot of different implementations that could allow it to exist. So I think the first question is basically, how do you associate all these different data points of different modalities together? And here we're kind of proposing the concept of spatiotemporal anchoring. So the idea is that for every data point you have, whether it's like, a moisture reading, a pressure reading, an image, you want to capture the location it was taken at and also the timestamp. And this way you can associate different instances across different modalities that happen at the same time and place, allowing the model to make cross-modal associations. Um, another question we're thinking about is basically how there is so much information in the world that has inherent structure to it. Um, so on the screen here is, the, is a bunch of graphs, which is a type of computer science data structure that refers to information that is structured in the form of nodes that are connected by graphs. So this is like one example of information that has inherent structure to it. And there is a lot of research going on in this field of geometric deep learning. So essentially, how do you take all of this information, whether it's like a table, whether it's a graph, and, and basically train a model on this information? Um, we think that this could be a potential way for the codec to handle all of the ecological information that has structure to it. Um, and then another kind of open question that we're really thinking about 
is that of formal models. So the whole earth codec is a statistical model. It's a machine learning model. And you know, it has no awareness of physical laws. It doesn't care how fluid dynamics works. Um, but ultimately, physics does determine a lot of what goes on in the earth. Um, if you think about traditionally how we've done weather prediction, it's through this sort of numerical method where the atmosphere and the oceans are partitioned into you know, cubic kilometers and then these very intensive, very heavy um, com forms of computation are done to calculate you know, what is the weather gonna be over the past next two weeks. And then recently we've sort of seen probabilistic modeling of weather forecasting. Um, people have kind of trained machine learning models to learn how to predict if it's gonna rain or not. And these are you know, far less computationally <laughs> intensive than doing a numerical weather prediction. But at the same time, like, it has no idea what ground, the ground truth is about physics. Um, I think an interesting area for the whole Earth Codec to think about is how can we merge these formal models such as the laws of physics with a statistical model. And so ultimately, I think we are quite architecture agnostic. I think mainly what we're interested in is the idea of compressing all of these different modalities into a single latent space and seeing what cross-modal associations the model is able to make that is not possible through just looking at a single modality. Um, and then the final area I wanna talk about is um, the third-party ecosystems that exist around the codec. So we are not thinking of this model as a monolith. Rather, we're thinking of it as a substrate for a lot of um, you know, descendants, a lot of descendant models. So the way that this works is, earlier I talked a little bit about how with foundation models, they're really general and you are, you can fine tune them so they get better at particular tasks. This is basically done through the process of transfer learning. So let's say you, know, you, want, you have a new task that you want the model to get better at, so you collect a lot of task specific data, and then you basically freeze some of the layers of the model that you have from pre-training earlier, and you only train a few of the layers on the new task, and then in this way you sort of fork off your pre-trained model into a, this like modified custom fine-tuned model that is better suited than the original for a particular task. And so we kind of imagine that the whole Earth codec can be a host to a whole ecosystem of you know, fine-tuned models that can be distributed, shared, and forked in an open source manner. We imagine that it could be, they could be created and used by <coughs> academic institutions, by private industry, and also just hobbyists in general. And I think this basically really opens up the space of possibility for the different futures that could arise from the Whole Earth Codec. Okay, so we've introduced this in a quite abstract and also technical way, um, but I think one of the ways of grounding this a bit more is also just going through some speculative scenarios of what would happen if we did this. Um, there's a term in cybersecurity called red teaming, which is basically where you deliberately hack or sort of um, mess with the system to try and expose its flaws, faults and errors. And in a way, this is a form of sort of going through these exercises is a form of like conceptual red teaming, sort of speculating about these scenarios and seeing sort of the positive or negative things that might come out of it. And to be clear, like we're not necessarily making a normative claim of the codec that this should exist in its sort of entirety. We're also using this, this speculative design as a way of provoking questions, broader questions around like, should we be using AI to mediate relations in the biosphere, et cetera. So this is a way that we can kind of arrive at some of these um, different things. So scenario one, uh, we have cetacean translation. It's 2031 and scientists have trained a fine-tuned version of the codec on a vast amount of multimodal data concerning whale behavior. The model becomes capable of interpreting whale speech and translating it into human language. The world is captivated. 
Initial findings reveal complex social structures, emotional depth, and even elements of what could be termed whale culture. Audio recordings of translated whale songs find their ways into TikToks, DJ sets, and pop songs. Conservationists and animal activists champion this development, assuming that this will lead to increased empathy and cause a broader societal shift towards increased animal welfare. But others condemn this as an exploitative violation of whale privacy. Do humans even have the right to decode and interpret whale communications without their consent? Entrepreneurial companies capitalize on this shift, developing generative models and underwater hydrophones which broadcast synthetic <coughs> whale vocalizations in an attempt to talk back to the whales. Whale communication experiences are offered and tourism booms, leading to increased marine traffic causing stress on whale populations. Communication is often unsuccessful, suggesting there is something fundamental about whale language outside of the scope of the model. Regardless, Synthetic vocalizations begin to profoundly alter whale migration patterns and breeding behaviors, leading to unpredictable transformations in ecosystems and food chains. In response, a codec improvement proposal for stricter restrictions on API access for generative purposes gains traction in the public forum. Public opinion remains split over the matter, but during a voting round, a quadratic mechanism nonetheless allocates a portion of codec funds towards the build out of new governance mechanisms into the codec that restrict non-research-based uses moving forward. So this is obviously one scenario of many that could come out uh, of this, but some of the concepts that it may allow us to think about more abstractly is this idea of a human-non-human -human interface where computation functions as an inter interspecies interface. So there's a lot of discussion in recent years about the parliament of things or representing non-human beings in sort of human legal systems, for example. But actually, like, how would that representation happen? How do you represent the needs or desires of a non-human entity? Is computation sort of a way in which that could happen? What are the limitations of that? These are some of the things we're thinking about. This speaks to the generative capacities of something. So uh, the, obviously with the sort of emergence of GPT and Dolly and Midjourney, we're really um, aware of sort of how these models can produce new content so easily. When that is applied to ecosystem information, what is a way that we can think of the production of a recipe for a forest, or for that matter, of a bioweapon. Um, and then, as Christina mentioned, we're thinking of governance in this example as a mechanism. We alluded to something similar to like an Ethereum-like mechanism for feature changes and, and upgrades. I'll give one more scenario, uh, which we're titling The Landscape of Risk. So in 2037, Canada is plagued by forest blight due to pine beetle infestation. Insurance providers developed a fine-tuned risk assessment model aimed at pine beetle detection. The model requires high-resolution bioacoustic, hyperspectral, and genomic information, leading to densification and extension of sensor network throughout the country. Sensor coverage thus becomes a prerequisite for insurance coverage. Genomic sequencing enables the identification of new warning indicators um, for the emergence of the pine beetle infestation. So early detection becomes widely successful and forest blight is greatly reduced, but also predictive insurance becomes deeply embedded in the management of natural systems throughout the country. The model detects novel warning indicators that defy our common sense, uh, leading to unexpected increases in premiums even in regions historically unaffected by blight. We can't really make sense of the decisions that the model is making. Um, this leads to grassroots resistance campaigns demanding more transparency in the decision-making process. It's clear that the model is generally actually working, but what do we do when its decision-making processes remain opaque? Trust in the system is further eroded due to a series of highly publicized ecological hallucinations in which some indicators used to determine premiums were later proven to just be hallucinatory, to be false. Political movements calling for alternatives to the profit-driven market-based insurance industry begin to gain traction. The Canadian Parliament begins discussion of socialization of the Environmental Insurance Agency. So some things we're thinking about in this case study are the notion of biospheric hallucinations, um, how, we, how hallucinated outputs might appear structurally correct but um, are actually factually inaccurate and in how to sort of manage and deal with these. And also something, um, called the epistemologic, 
epistemology confidence problem, which refers to the fact in um, the scientific method, traditionally we rely on um, the ability to explain and reproduce the results um, clearly, but when this is applied to more black box um, AI systems, how does this collapse um, sort of legacy models of um, scientific research? All right, so now we're sort of coming to the end and I'm gonna step back a little bit and kind of talk about the Holroth Codec more broadly, so how it was conceived, how we think about it, how we use it to think with. Um, so we originally developed this speculative proposal at Antikythera, so during this, at this think tank for the speculative philosophy of computation. Um, and recently, at the end of last year, we focused um, a little more specifically on governance of the model. So we spent some time at PACT during a residency thinking about, you know, how would you actually govern the whole Earth Codec and its different processes. Um, in the next couple of months, we're sort of going to be working on some research into how the Codec expands the notion of ownership, specifically that of non-human ownership. Um, you know, how can sort of technological mediation allow us to access this information about non-human organisms. Um, so yeah, I think ultimately we're kind of using the codec as a discursive object, um, as a container, if you will, and I think we're quite, it's quite open-ended as to what this can become and what the future holds for the whole Earth codec. Um, so I want to kind of briefly talk about the governance research that we did recently um, because we think that the codec poses as much of a governance question as it poses a technical one. So we sort of broke it down into four areas, the first of which is infrastructure. So, you know, what is the material hardware in which the codec lives? You know, who maintains the data centers and the sensors? What are the incentives? for you know, pitching in to the system. The second area is that of information flow. So thinking about who has access to what, not only the earth data that is being used, but also the source code. And we sort of conceived of it as this like really distributed, federate, federated computation that allows us to have more granular information flow between different parties. Um, the third area is resourcing. So we were thinking a little bit about, you know, not only where does the energy for running the codec, where does it come from, but also what, where does the capital come from? Um, we were thinking through, yeah, some collective ownership mechanisms and sort of modeling the whole Earth codec as a public <coughs> good. Um, we finally were thinking about evolution. So this. I think broadly refers to how does the codec actually change over time? You know, what governs the processes of changing the code, changing what it does? Um, and we, here we sort of looked a lot towards different open source projects such as Ethereum, but also different internet protocols, you know? And I think a more speculative philosophical question we had was what forms of evolution can be sort of self-governed by the machine? Like can the codec sense and simulate its own limits. Um, yeah, so I think we're gonna kind of finish off alluding to all of the open questions that we're thinking about now, some that were gestured towards during the course of this presentation. Um, yeah, and ultimately we're kind of presenting the whole Earth Codec as more of a specification with all this philosophical possibility. And we think that you know, there's all these technical and philosophical questions to keep in mind as if the codec existed, how would it and the earth recurse <laughs> alongside? So um, this, wouldn't be, this project really wouldn't be possible without a whole host of people requiring a lot of support, guidance, and manual labor. Um, and specifically, we wanna kind of give a shout out to our third collaborator, Delina, who lives in the faraway city of Los Angeles. Um, yeah, thank you so much, and we look forward to thinking through this with you. Thank you.
Maybe? Yeah. Thank you so much, Karen and Christina. Um, we're going to take questions if you have them. We can't hear Can you speak up a bit, please? Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thanks for the presentation. A very specific question. As you mentioned that uh, the planet Earth gives some data which has been received and processing happens. Is there something that can be accessed historically? Let's say 100 years from now, some historical data within the five elements of the Earth. Can that be accessed and can be processed? Um, data from the past? With that's a really interesting point, and we haven't really thought about that. Yeah, but I do, th that, that's really interesting. We haven't thought about that, but I think just off the top of my head, like surely there is a lot of ar archeological data or like stuff captured in like, ge like, you know, in the rocks, in the tree trunks that can be used to derive past information. Um, also yeah, in really like ecological insurance it, like industry and sort of predicting against future natural disasters or something, a lot of this is using um, historical data as well to build these models of future risk. So this is, this is something that's already quite incorporated. Our gaze has been mostly focused on the capturing of sort of present and future data, but for what it's worth also, um, we're interesting on like, interested in piggybacking on already existing infrastructures um, so we're not necessarily proposing that we need a whole build out of all these new sensors that then we're gonna start collecting data, but it's actually a really sort of banal technical question of like data format and compatibility and sort of pooling these data together um, in reality. Yeah. Let's say that if I want to place the sensors in, in a beach to certain kilometers and identify a particular contaminant 50 years before and predict it to the next 500 years, only particular contaminant within the waters. Is it possible to achieve? Um, I mean, one of the like primary like things we're interested about, about the foundation model architecture is the sort of rapid capability scaling that comes with collecting data at scale. So that's why we're sort of interested in this at the planetary scale is that there's something to be said about the ability to sort of make these generalizations and emergent insights the more sort of data that you have. So if it's a question of like prototyping or, or testing the codec just on an individual beach, I'm not sure if it would have the sort of impacts that we're imagining or exploring. Mm. Thank you so much for this presentation. Your project is, wow, mind-blowing. It's amazing. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask about the visuals. Um, how are they generated, if they are data generated, or if it's an artistic interpretation, or? Yeah. Um, no, we, we didn't implement the whole Earth Codec. So <laughs> all of our visuals were made by the three of us in Unreal Engine. So. They're all CGI, um, yeah. If you want to see, so the format of the project right now is a 20 minute short film. Um, and it's, the URL's here, if you're interested. You can watch it as a continuous uh, video, yeah. Yeah. I, I also wanted to ask, uh, if I can, about, <laughs> about um, Antikythera. What exactly is the, Planet, speculative. <laughs> Great question. Um, yeah, okay, so Antikythera, or Antikythera, as Daphne, my student, will remind me in the 
proper <laughs> Greek pronunciation, was the first computer. And it was found off the Greek island of Antikythera in 200 BC. And that uh, it's understood to be the first computer because it was kind of an instrument for um, navigation as much as calculation. So taking inspiration from that computer, there's um, a think tank that runs out of a out of a bigger think tank called the Berggruen Institute in La that has sites in Los Angeles, Beijing, and Venice. And that <coughs> institute is kind of producing new ideas. And Antikythera, Antikythera is particularly interested in the philosophy of technology and kind of the future of planetary computation. <coughs> so what are the implications for computation? How can we think on this on a bunch of domains? You can. You should definitely go to Kodak.Earth, but you can also check out antikythera.org and see what the organization is up to. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hey. Um, so, as I understand it, the project kind of rests on like a few, I think like, valid claims, but kind of slightly speculative, which is that um, foundation models can produce, like, multimodal foundation models can produce correlations or find patterns within <coughs> large complex systems like ecosystems or maybe economy or other things, which we can't currently find, that we can adequately sense or model certain planetary systems in a way which makes this these predictions and observations useful. Um, there was another one, but I can't remember. I'm just curious, because it sounds kind of, you know, with large array telescopes and stuff, you have this problem, which is you're basically farming photons. You have so much data, <laughs> you're, and you're not, you're, you're, it's, ver it's very hard even to crunch through that. And that's only one type of data. There's only one mode. It's essentially just like um, light sensitivity. And so in your case, um, are there examples of large, complex, multimodal, models that are in use in whichever domain which are um, currently being experimented with, which are you know, not quite to the ambition of even whole local ecosystems or something perhaps, but are nonetheless being used um, yeah, to, to make predictions. I mean, the insurance industry I don't think uses any of this yet, and they're the closest probably to some of this. I still assume finance might be interested very much in these. They're always trying to find hidden patterns. But yeah, I'm curious if you guys have come across any <coughs> extant models. Um, there is, I don't think it's at the scale that you're referring to, but there is an ongoing initiative that's trying to use foundation models for multimodal ecological information. Um, it's called SETI, um, the Cetacean Translation Initiative. It's a reference to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, but it's this is where we built our... Um, our whale sort of speculative scenario from, because this is actually a real project. Um, there's a, it's a research initiative that's using a large language model um, in part and assembling a bunch of different multimodal information about whale behavior. So not just um, whale codas or whale vocalizations, um, but it's also using biometric sensors of whale heartbeats and temperature um, underwater hydrophones, underwater cameras that are um, recording body, um, like body position and sort of also environmental sensors capturing around environmental um, surroundings to try and arrive at an understanding because maybe the language can't just be understood linguistically or just through audio, um, but trying to, compare, trying to combine all of these multimodal um, data streams into a um, something that might look like translation. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, it's, it's a very domain specific example. Mm. I don't know outside of, I don't know if there's other things that come to mind. Yeah, I think most multimodal models are, like I said, the biggest ones are still bimodal. It's like uh, the image text models. Um, I think in your question, I hear a little bit of skepticism of like, oh, like what, at the scale of this data, like what, can a useful model still be generated? And I think maybe the answer there sort of comes from our discussion around this idea of compression. Like I think we kind of position this a bit, this like unintuitive idea, which is that 
you know, actually by stripping away detail, maybe you're able to see more abstractions about what's going on. Um, and I think one could assume that maybe the codec could learn to, you know, discard data that it thinks is not useful for its predictions or like really only reinforces what it already has learned. Like I think <coughs> there's probably a lot of technological mechanisms that, sub-mechanisms that could allow you to, um, you know, learn what data is useful to actually learn from. Um, so yeah, I think that's a good question though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are, it's not on the multimodal scale, but there are existing efforts in climate modeling that you referenced, but many that look at, um, you know, global scale, maybe planetary scale, but it's missing a lot of data on weather forecasting and precipitation. And um, yeah, there are huge technical challenges in, in capturing kind of like this trade off between granularity and global, globality. That's not a word. <laughs> Uh, but I actually think this like fits into the speculative framework of federated learning and also like a federated <coughs> inference. Like when you run the model, I think you would need to distribute the computation and, and it's in the spirit of your kind of organizational framework. Um, and sorry, this is mostly going to just be commentary. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, and I also think that the, the governance structure stuff is new. I, I saw, saw like the, the video and stuff, but um, I think the governance structure is relevant to real questions right now about how we govern foundation models, mm -hmm. right? Like, I'm, I'm sure you're thinking about that, but that it, like, I want to emphasize this is not, doesn't have to be purely speculative. Mm -hmm. um. Cool, thank you. I find the project uh, particularly impressive, but um, I have a question about, um, so kind of like talking about the scientific model, right? Uh, generally, there is a form of hypothesis, no? And then you, you look at if this hypothesis. I, I find that beside the technicality, this lack a little bit of hypothesis and what, because um, I'm not expert of AI, but I suppose we know that ChatGPT is good because we have some form of comparison, right? Mm -hmm. So we have, we, we, we can find the, the, the power of that model because we already know how to write. Um, same thing for Dali. Uh, in this, I don't see that comparison. I don't see, so I, you, you're not gonna, you're gonna struggle to see the pattern. Mm. Um, that's, I think, is the most uh, <coughs> critical point. And then, why you don't think more uh, MVP side, though, so where, where there is some form of, uh, of Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, I think what you were saying in the beginning about like, oh, the scientific proceeds is really funny because I think there's been a lot of criticism of machine learning that, you know, they are straight up doing away with scientific hypotheses. Like it's now all about correlation, not causation. Um, like that's just the way they do science through machine. That's what machine learning is. Um, yeah, and I think maybe in the second half of your question, I'm kind of hearing some curios curiosity about like, how do we know if the codec is actually doing what it claims to do? Or like, how is it, is it actually good at what it claims to do? Um, and I think that, you know, uh, we, don't, we don't think, we're not proposing that we like, you know, cede control to what the whole earth codec is describing. Like I think um, we are interested in this computational infrastructure that proves provides like a sensing and acting apparatus on the earth. But I think that, um, you know, trust can be built slowly. Like maybe you can sort of start with small scale. Like, oh, you know, for my farmland over here, what do I have to do to make sure that I have fertile crops or whatever? Um, and then, you know, maybe it's something where you start with very small scale and as the codec demonstrates, you know, long-term small scale um, useful capacity, then you can, slowly build up what you ask it to do. Same as building trust with any person, I think. 
Before we just go to our online audience, um, we've got compliments and one question. So Andres de Miguel says, just wanted to thank Connor and Christina for their presentation, super clear and motivating. And Betty Marenko says, thank you for the terrific presentation. My question is about the relation between sensing and cognition. And I wonder where slash how you would see or like to see the impact of codec on human cognition. Mm. That's a really good question. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, I think one of the ways that we're, it's, it's thinking about this, we've mentioned it as a substrate, but also as an interface or something like this. And I think it's, it's interesting to take it back down to like an individual human level on the, in the sense mm. of like, at the level of decision-making processes or how we see the world. Mm. Um, I need to think of this. Yeah, well I think it's hard to, it's hard to think about because um, I think there's like approach to building AI that is quite like first person POV, you know, it's like, oh maybe you have like a robot in the world and it has an experience. Mm. And then you have what we're proposing which is this like massive third, what's it called? Third, third party POV, like um, distributed kind of sensing. So it is kind of hard to <coughs> restrict it to, bring it back down to human scale. Um, I think one of, sorry, one of the things that we were trying to look at in one of the scenarios was like this gap that emerges if the codec starts like in the insurance example, like um, detecting a sort of pattern that is not um, detectable to us, that like defies our common sense understanding, but nonetheless has a sort of effective um, uh, function in the world. If it's effective at reducing this pine beetle infestation, like how do we relate to this sort of intelligence that um, is sort of alien and unexplainable to ours? I don't know. That could be invigorating or enthralling, or it could be extremely terrifying. I'd imagine there's something a bit intuitive that would be quite hard to wrap our heads around, and it's hard to foresee exactly what the more societal impacts of that would be. Yeah. I mean. I think I, I've definitely, I've thought about the question of like, you know, human cognition and how it's modified by, by future AI more broadly, not related to the whole Earth Codec. Um, and I think it probably has something to do with sort of the sort of like higher dimensional representations that we're talking about here. Like, um, yeah, I think in like information transmission is a lot of how we can create complexity, you know, we have a grammar, therefore we can describe more complex things. Um, but like, you know, we're limited to human language, which is, you know, kind of restrained in its dimensionalities, in, um, in its temporalities. I think something that I've been thinking about of, yeah, how could AI extend human cognition is the idea of allowing us to communicate with more, with like higher, dimensional representations. Like right now I cannot transmit to you my thoughts. I can try to say something and convey it to you. But maybe with machine augmentation, it can become possible to sort of capture higher dimensional information transmission. Um, but that has nothing, has nothing to do with the codec. It's just my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I forget who coined this term, but someone coined the term cognitive assemblages as a way of thinking of how we relate to AI and specifically how we relate to other intelligences other than our own. And I like the framing of the assemblage as something that is somehow loose and provisional, um, but nonetheless, like we enter, when we're, like I was recently reading a really difficult theoretical text and I was constantly using GPT as a means of like asking questions about it. And in that essence, like I enter into some sort of alliance or assemblage with this machinic intelligence that's like sort of we're somehow interfacing to make sense of this thing in the world. Um, and I think these like loose, more, these more loose relations that can emerge and sort of dismantle, mm. it's interesting to think about what that would mean with something that's telling us fundamentally about maybe patterns or perspectives of non-human beings um, in a quite optimistic sense. Like we had the animal activists in our example, being excited that this would allow us, it would reshape the sort of 
um, emotional or affective relations to um, other species like whales. Um, I think that's a really interesting possibility. Um, not necessarily about speaking to whales or like needing to somehow fold that back into our human experience, but somehow this recognition um, through these computational abstractions of other intelligences, I think would profoundly shape our, our psyche and our place within the, um, within the world. Cool, and just a few more from online. So we'll start with Henry van der Spoy, who asks, any specific sensory devices and or locations you'd be interested in building to prototype this? Um, we're all, we're often coming back to bioacoustic sensors we find really mm. interesting. Because um, bioacoustics is so cool. Yeah, um, <laughs> and it's a really rich field of research that there's already a lot of bioacoustic sensing. Mm. Um, locations, I haven't thought about personally. Mm -mm. Um, it is a question that we're thinking of, if, if like we wanted to move beyond just like a purely speculative exercise and start to prototype or like prototype these things, like how would we start this at a small scale. There's something fundamental about foundation models that Christina introduced, which is this like massive scale that, of data that they're trained on. And if we look into the sort of political economy of this, what that means in reality is that very few actors in the world have the resources to train these models. And so there's a, a very limited sort of window of agency to if the sort of emergent capabilities of these models come from the aggregation of data at scale, how do you prototype a foundation model like as us, you know, or as Antikythera or whatever in small ways? Um, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know how to answer mm -hmm. that question, but yeah. it's something we're interested in also looking into like if, if we think, I mean, AI is already being used to mediate and make sense of um, sort of ecosystems and um, planetary scale systems. I think, we think it's a really, um, the reason that we're quite interested in governance is like, you know, it would mean very different things if the codec was owned by like one private corporation versus thought of as like a commons or collective resource. So these different political configurations are something that we're uh, quite interested in exploring. Yeah, I think in the beginning when we were developing this project, we talked a little bit about like, oh, we should do a prototype in like somewhere where a lot of humans are and like somewhere where there aren't a lot of humans to kind of suss out the vibe. Mm. Um, yeah, I think in terms of sensors, one we didn't really talk about in this presentation is um, like watersheds and mm -hmm. the genomic mm. information. I think there is really interesting research being done when um, it's called like watershed genomic sequencing, something like this, um, where if you look at basically where all the water of a certain region goes, you can basically capture a lot of information about the genetic makeup of the population that that area includes. Um, you can do things like, for example, probably monitor for like gene drives. Mm -hmm. Um, so like if someone's trying to like, you know, tweak some genomic sequence to eradicate all mosquitoes, you could detect that from just the water samples. Um, you know, post COVID, I think they could really monitor <coughs> how many people were sick based off of the sewage system. Like there's a lot of really cool methods of sensing out there that we're interested in. And also it's cool because I think it really emphasizes the idea of human as a subset of the ecology. Mm -hmm. like, I don't think anyone is worried about their data privacy if they're collecting your sewage. Like, no one knows your personal information from that. Um, so I think, yeah, this idea of sort of like, dis, dis, all this like disindividuated data that is available from things like watersheds is quite interesting to us as well. The watershed stuff is really cool also because in a way like the geography or topography of a landscape literally creates these data streams and these pooling effects just by nature of the sort of shape of the land, how water moves, that then you can capture these like, um, the, these like um, aggregate samples in one site that we think these like data streams and data pools is, yeah, quite a fun thing to think through. Cool, and the last question, we have AL who asks, asks two questions actually. What do you say to people who are fearful of AI and write off 
this idea because of that fear. And secondly, any recommended reading slash literature slash video around the topic for those wanting to learn more? Okay. Um, yeah, well, I think that Ted Chiang said it best and that people are not afraid of technology, they're afraid of capitalism. So I think, um, yeah, I feel like, I don't know, not to say that all technology is neutral, but I think that, um, you know, I think there's a lot of critique that can be leveraged at AI models, but I also think it, you should not dismiss what they're capable of out of hand, you know, like, at the same time, yeah, you don't want to overstate what they can do, but you also, like, I think computational reason is this new thing that we're sort of on the precipice on, and I think it does, it can reveal things that biological reasoning cannot. Um, I can talk about this for a while, though. And I think, yeah, on recommended reading, I don't know, I feel like there's a lot of research papers on, like, AI models, foundation models. It's kind of dry, though. Um, I think maybe some, a book that I enjoy that I feel like is related to this work is, um, there's an Ed Young book called An Immense World. So this is the one where he's talking a lot about different types of animal sensing. Um, and I think it's just really crazy how many different forms of sensing and creating this internal experience there is. And I think, I think that book, at least for me, really helped sort of decenter the human while thinking about the AI model and the forms of data that it can take in. Like, really the human sort of sensorium is like, yeah, there's, it's just like one of like billions. So that, that's a book I enjoyed a lot. Mm, I don't know if I would recommend this book. Because <laughs> it's like, this is the book I was reading with GPT because it's impossible <laughs> to read. But if you're interested in the more like philosophical implications, um, of the project, there's a book called *The GCL* by an A. A. Kavia, um, which goes into the sort of, sort of, um, geometric underpinnings of AI and how we can extrapolate philosophical um, um, sort of claims and claims about logic and the sort of fundamentally geometric nature of logic, as he claims, um, from looking at the sort of topology of the um, the model architecture. Um, it was very stimulating for me, but uh, it's not fun to read. <laughs> it's like painful. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned about uh, making these trials on a smaller scale. So is it possible that in a smaller scale itself to identify drought, what has been the drought condition from 1985, if you, historically, then predict it to the next 20,000 years at a particular region. Or else, if you're looking forward to do as in a whole planet-wise, how you will be able to achieve this? 30,000 years. 20,000, next 20,000 years. Okay. Hmm. Historically, from today till 1985, after you receive that data, then process it to the next 20,000 years, confined to one region, if you want to do it in a smaller scale. Let's say that you're confident of, as a whole planet, that, that is what it is capable of. If you're trying to achieve as a whole planet, how are you going to do that? Um, I feel like there's some limits as to what you can do with that, like, would, would not be affected by whatever happens in those 20,000 years between mm -hmm. the time you make that prediction. Um, yeah. Because if the model is just based on samples of... Um, moisture or whatnot in the air leaves out all of these questions of, you know, how human culture or war or economic <laughs> systems would affect that landscape in a way. So I'm also not a technical expert at all about AI, but I know, for example, in like AI music generation and, and stuff or video generation, it becomes really hard to generate long sequences if you're d doing a text-based video generation to generate a coherent long-term sequence of video. Like it sort of begins to evolve. Um, I don't know if that's what would be happening, but I'd imagine that these predictions that we're making would somehow sort of like fold in on themselves and devolve. Mm. And I don't think that would necessarily be an ambition that we would have for the codec is this type of long-term forecasting. Um, I don't think that would yeah. be its strength. Or it kind of like raises into question how much is deterministic. It's yeah. like, oh, how much have we done over the past... 30 years that would just like enforce droughts no matter what happened, you know? So I think 
probably in the output predictions, there's some sort of granularity about, um, or like the stakes of the prediction, you know, or like this is the prediction given that this happens, what not. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Let's have a big round of applause for Christina and Connor. Um, yeah, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Just for, um, we're putting together a field guide for planetary sensing. So if you're curious about how to learn more, read more about the whole concept, that should be coming out as part of the DISC program in the coming week. Um, but yeah, please join us for future events, um, either online or here at CSM. Thank you. <laughs>